Um, welcome everybody tonight. My name is Amy Lucky, and I am the donor engagement lead here at the Glacier National Park Conservancy. Um, I'm honored to lead our conversation tonight. We have given our executive director, Doug Mitchell, the night off. Um, so I am here to host and my coworkers, Sean, Geneva, and Stacy are gonna help me out. And tonight we have just a wonderful presentation. I feel like we're going to learn so much. Um, we advertise this conversation as a history of fire lookouts and kind of an update on what's going on in the park. Um, but I feel like we are going to learn a whole lot from our guests tonight. We have Amy Grisak here. Um, she's joining us from Great Falls, Montana. Um, and Amy is a writer and a photographer, and I would say an all around naturalist and outdoors woman. Um, and so we're just really happy to have her. Um, Amy, do you want to say a few words about what your presentation tonight? Well, thank you, Amy. See, the nice thing is with two Amy's here, if somebody just has to yell Amy and one of us will answer, but no, I just wanted to share about my love of lookouts in general and the whole fire history of Glacier too, that caught my attention so early. And I think once people know some of the backstories, what's going on in the park, that it's really gonna fascinate them as well. Super, and I know you have a presentation. Do you wanna go ahead and jump in and share your screen? Sure, we'll see if we can't share this whoopsies no okay let's see did that share did that work amy that looks great okay well let's see i guess i'll hit play so thank you everybody for spending the evening with us it is a treat to be able to have a captive audience to talk about fire lookouts. And like I post in this very first slide, this program is a lot about the love of lookouts and what they mean for the history of Montana, the history of the United States and particularly the West and really the what they mean to all of us. So as many of you probably recognize, this is Scalp Lock and my friend Darcy's probably gonna kill me for using your photo, but I'll tell her about it later. So, you know, what, why do we go to lookouts? You know, one part is to capture a bit of history, like as with Scalp Lock, and another is for the views. That's one of the first things that caught my attention when it came to fire lookouts is you hike up this hill. I mean, what crazy person would gain three, four, 5,000 feet in elevation over a relatively short miles, you know, in distance, other than something of you like this. It's just absolutely stunning. Fire lookouts are without question are the best view in the house. So to back up a little bit, I wanted to give you a little bit of my history and background. And like I was talking ahead of time, Amy, you know, this was definitely a winding trail, a winding path to be able to get to this point where now I'm focusing a lot of my efforts on fire lookouts throughout Montana. So I can, I guess, start, it all started 32 years ago at the Isaac Walton Inn, when shortly after high school, my plan was to move to Montana, become a wildlife biologist, focusing on wolves. You know, I, the megafauna totally got my attention. And, but of course, back then, when you're receiving a newspaper to find an apartment in Missoula, you got it a week late, everything was sold out. You know, the, they were gone by the time you called. I saw an, a little ad for the Isaac Walton. I called, they hired me over the phone and I packed up and went to work. I didn't know anybody in Montana, but I figured I had a place to live and a job. So this is where I landed. Now, as all of you or many of you probably know, the Isaac Walton is located in Essex, Montana, which is on the Southern border of Glacier and the railroad tracks run past. And so on my time off, I would hike the tracks looking for grizzlies not recommended but this is what i would do you know as the the ignorance of your youth but the railroad guys a lot of times would come in they would have coffee and they would tell me you know there's a scrawny looking bear about a mile down this way and so i would traipse off that way looking for the bear and 
thankfully I never found it. But, you know, there's a few times I heard things, but never found a bear, which I think is my guardian angels, which I'm pretty positive they drank heavily during that time period in my life. But also at the Isaac Walton ended up meeting a cameraman who had come in. He was working on a program about Glacier National Park for nature on PBS, and he needed somebody to pack gear. So uh, hard to tell sitting here. I'm only five feet tall, obviously not a basketball player, but I was a national champion powerlifter. So packing gear was right up my alley. And so that's what I started to do. And so for 10 years, I packed gear and I was also a sound recordist and a, ended up associate producer for National Geographic Television. And so during this time we worked on, it was always the joke that worked on attack films. It was like, it was bear attacks because in the nineties, for those who might remember is before the advent of bear spray that with our bit of morbid humor, we would often joke that summer didn't begin until there was the first bear mauling because that's how it was pretty much every summer. It would be like somebody would get nailed and summer could finally be official. But so the first program I worked on was Bear Attacks and also did one up in Banff called Urban Elk, which was another, you know, elk, bull elk chasing people around, which was an absolute blast. Mostly though, because it was two weeks of absolutely intense filming. And the best part though, was the National Geographic crew was out and they had the credit card. So we ate really well, which was, which was a lot of fun. Uh, another one was Giants of Jasper, where I spent about a year up in Jasper National Park and worked on two programs with mountain lions, which was very eye-opening, especially when a mountain lion attacked my dog in Corum. Just here, I'd been traveling all, all over the state looking for the cats and was home and just outside my house in Corum. Like I said, he came back in. Thankfully, everything was okay, but yeah, they're, they are there and we never see them. That's the big takeaway with that. And then one of the last ones I worked on was a program with Bob Landis down in Yellowstone on coyotes, which was a lot of fun And Yellowstone. It was a very gorgeous time down there. So with those 10 years, you know, because you're not in the field all the time and I lived in Corum, I built gardens. I built 220 raised beds out of stone. And that's actually how I started with my freelance career. So in the late nineties or so, the film industry, like for National Geographic, BBC, we were all shooting 16 millimeter film. It was transitioning to digital, which required a considerable investment. You know, it's like, is this going to be worth it type thing? And so I, and I was tired of traveling. I was tired of going up to Alaska when I could finally feel my fingers in the spring. You know, I'm sitting, you know, you, the land of perpetual winter and it finally warms up and they're like, ah, guess what? You're going north. So felt I wanted to get out of that. And so with the gardens, I had a little place in Quorum called Shady Side Herb Farm, I had a shop and everything. And I started writing to editors saying, I have these gardens and you know, I would like you to write a story on them. And the editors came back and said, no, we want you to write the story. And that's how I launched into freelancing. I mean, I've always written throughout my life, but that's how business wise, they pulled me into that industry, which was great, you know, and learning, learning the business part of that business or that, that vocation basically. And that's how I began my freelance writing. So a couple of, well, I guess it's been 2018 at a conference of the Outdoor Writers Association of America, which was, is a, con, or is a group that's been around almost a hundred years. They, hold an annual conference every year. And even though I wasn't able to attend this year, an editor from Falcon was, and I won an award. I think it was a second place award. And he contacted me and he said, he asked, do you have any book ideas? Now, what writer are you going to ask? Do you have any book ideas? Who's going to say no. So of course I have book ideas. So, you know, we, I threw a bunch out at them and this, the nature Guide to Glacier and Waterton Lakes National Parks is the one that fit them best at the time. They had done this series with other national parks, but they hadn't done one for Glacier and Waterton. So that he you know, said, can you get this done? And basically gave me 10 months to do it. And in my little rookie excited mode, I'm like, okay, 
okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, a whole 10 months. You know, the good thing was, as I told him, you know, I'd been in the park for 30 years almost at the time. And, and I said that, you know, I've never gotten a full frame of a Wolverine, but he said, we'll be able to use stock and things like that. So that took that pressure off, but it's still, it was a very intense year of being in the park, the boys and I, as much as we possibly could to take photos of the plants and the animals and the rocks and just everything we could. And so lots of great adventures on that. And it was an absolute, I always say this book was an absolute joy. It was whether I was in the park photographing for it or writing it and researching it, it always gave me joy. Wasn't happy when I had to cut 12,000 words out of it, but it was still a lot of fun. <laughs> so that led me to this next one. So the late, our, my latest project, like I said, is about fire lookouts. And the one that I'm working on for Falcon, actually we're kind of on hold. We don't have a hard deadline now because of last year's fires and then this year the way things are going, but it's hiking fire lookouts in Montana. So we're gonna focus on about 40 fire lookouts throughout the state and the trails, you know, what the trails are like getting to them. So people know how to access them and you know how to how to reach these as well as the history and the history is something that's very important to me because well i'll tell you just you know in a second it's kind of the foundation of why i'm even interested in doing these and i think it's important for people to understand why we have these fire lookouts plus to understand what makes each one of them special you know so many are similar in design and in architecture and things like that but everyone has its unique story. And that's something that I really want to express in this upcoming book. And to back up, this is, you know, one of the reasons that I'm even here. Uh, David Butler wrote this book, I think about 10 years ago, and I can't remember how long it was that I read it. And it's a great historical book, really good information, but it just blew me away because in this book, you know, we have the nine little, lookouts that we have now that are still standing but then there's all these there so I think there were 17 lookouts total in Glacier and realized there are all these lookouts that used to be there and they were you know some of them were gorgeous or they're in gorgeous areas and it's like what happened and so I started researching that and then I started finding stories about fires in Glacier and, you know, so many times we'll say, you know, we'll see statistics, we'll see a year and how many tens of thousands or hundred thousands of acres have burned in the park and kind of that numerical devastation, if you will. But then when I started researching the lookouts after reading David's book, then I realized there's even better stories there. And so one I wanted to share with you tonight, that was a fascinating, fascinating look into this history was the Heaven's Peak Fire from 1936. Now to back up a little bit, of course, you know, Glacier was founded in 1910 or established in 1910. And that was a humdinger of a year out here. It's often called the big blow up year, you know, where 3 million acres burned between Montana and Idaho and Washington. And I mean, it was just chaos, mayhem all wrapped together. So after 1910, the early Forest Service and the National Park Service ended up adopting kind of the same protocol is they wanted to get those fires out by 10 a.m. If there was a wisp of smoke somewhere, by golly, there would be, you know, dozens of men hiking up with tools to go get that fire out. And, you know, the whole Smokey Bear type advertisement later on, it was get those fires out as soon as possible. Let's go to what started to happen with the Heaven's Peak fire. So 1936, really hot year. And I think it was like August 18th, there was a lightning storm, but they didn't see anything for a few days. It was, I think about the 21st, they spotted smoke. So they grabbed 50 guys headed up there. They're battling it with tools. Within 24 hours, there were about 500 guys on this thing. And they were in an area on the west side near the gla glacier wall. I mean, they no water, just tools. I mean, there wasn't any water accessible. And after a few days, they felt by the 29th, they were feeling pretty good. I mean, even the superintendent's report said, you know, it looks like it's out. We're not going to have to worry about it. Very next day, hot wind came through, blew up. There's fire brands going up to the loop. 
going up towards Granite Park. It is just absolute mayhem. So of course at Granite Park Chalet, the employees there, the stone building, so that's all good, but the employees decide they're gonna stay and they're putting wet blankets on the shake roof because it's, you know, the wooden roof, it catches, it goes. So they're putting wet blankets on there and it's getting increasingly bad as that fire is coming up. At one point, Hugh Black, who owns St. Mary, he was going to try to get horses in to try to get these guys out, but the winds just picked up too much. And so they ended up fighting that fire with wet blankets and whatever little water that they had. And the fire burned the meadow and burned around and then just went up over. And so in the meantime, you have everybody down at Many Glacier. And at that, that night, they could see the glow on the other side, but they didn't think it was going to jump the garden wall. They, they thought it would be safe. Next day, you know, it starts coming over, burned all the base of Wilbur. And actually, as it's coming over, there was one gentleman who said there were a couple of red orbs. He said it looked like dragon's eyes coming over the top and coming down into the valley. And so it comes roaring down. It came through swift current motor in, burned several of the sections, I think like the B section, C section, part of D. But what was really weird is it would go through and it would burn a cabin so hot it would melt the iron stove where the one next to it would be absolutely fine. Burn the many glacier chalets except the couple that are remaining. Employee cabins, those were gone. And in the meantime, at about 10, 10.30 that evening, they had evacuated everybody. And so the people, all the guests were get, leaving and employees, like the one guy, I think his name was Don Wheeler, and he played piano and he was packing up and trying to get out of there and a bear charged right at him, but it went right past because the bear was just trying to get away. And so everybody you know, was evacuating whoever they could they did have a fire crew and they had done drills. So, I mean, they were on top of this and they had, you know, the water pumps and everything. They were hosing down the Many Glacier Hotel trying to save it. And they did, you know, obviously we did not lose it. They drained the water pretty much completely. And that next day, somebody wired in the Great Northern in their headquarters in Minnesota and said that the hotel was saved. And the response was why? because it was the middle of the Great Depression and they were losing money. So it wouldn't have bothered them one bit if they would have lost it. So that was one that, you know, really caught my attention. And then two with, you know, Granite Park and, and 36, of course, you know, going through the meadows and thankfully it's not an area where the fire is probably going to burn very hot. And in 2003 too, as well. It, it came very close. Uh, there was an article in the was it Glacier National Park Association oh, Conservancy, NPCA, from T. Tempest Williams. It was, she wrote it in 2016. And so they were, she and a group, there were about a dozen of them staying at Granite Park Chalet and the fire was coming up. And the fire chief was there. They decided nobody should leave, even though her brother and I think his girlfriend or wife, they took off on the high line and they thought they were going to be dead. They thought there was no way they would escape. And there were a couple other people that were also not accounted for. But in the meantime, the fire chief told everybody, get in the middle of the chalet, kids in the center. He said, it's going to get really hot. He said, the, the glass will probably shatter. Oxygen will probably be sucked out of the chalet for a few seconds, but hopefully it's going to just be hot and it's going to go through and it's going to go fast. And so that's what they did. But what was odd is it didn't happen. It didn't break. It didn't go through them. It went around and their brother, her brother and sister-in-law, so it just parted around and then it rejoined and then it went right up swift current again, which is just absolutely eerie. So her brother and his girlfriend were fine. And also the two others that were unaccounted for actually hid out in the restroom and in the bathrooms there. And if they said, if they were gonna have to jump in, they would jump in, but thankfully they did okay. But just absolutely eerie that that fire parted around the chalet, but thank goodness it did. <laughs> we love it. So then another Apgar lookout, you know, and and 
was that 1929 apgar lookout and then lone man lookout were both built during the same year but lone man was about a third of the way built and apgar was a good hunk and the half moon fire came through and burned them and so may of 1930 you know, boy they worked fast i mean i think lone man workout or lookout was rebuilt within a couple of weeks and APGAR too. And what I always thought was interesting was APGAR lookout is like emergency appropriation funds cost $1,600 to build, <laughs> which now you, yeah, you couldn't even buy the nails, I don't think for that. So, but yeah, so it's since 1930 now, it's doing great. And it's really interesting to go through the archives though, and to see the differences, especially after a burn, to see the trees then and then now, of course, uh, subsequent burns have gone through there too, but it's really neat to see. Well, like I mentioned, you know, with these backstories, those fascinated me. And then also with reading David's book and realizing that there, we used to have lookouts that we don't have now. You know, at one point, think at the high point, Montana had 639 lookouts. Now there's 140 ish. It's actually hard to get a solid number on that and about 40 or so are staffed typically you know national park service of course and then also forest service so about 40 or so are staffed during the summer months um, most are forest service or national park service employees others are volunteers like in firefighter which is this lookout near hungry horse reservoir and then in montana we have a couple of dozen couple dozen rentals, which actually in Montana, we had the most rentals as anybody in the country, which is really kind of cool. And it is nice that they are putting more into the rental program. You know, honestly, I would like to see them used as they're intended with either full, you know, staff members or volunteers, trained volunteers, because I think it's a really important part of the whole legacy. But anytime we could get a lookout refurbished, and and don't lose any more is wonderful in my book one of the things that i really learned is the lookouts are as amazing as the lookouts who look out so we use we can diagram these sentences all day with all these lookouts but the people who are in the lookouts are really special people these this was a gentleman up at porphyry lookout which is near us on king's hill and showing our son how to use the firefighter finder and these are people who love the woods they they love the landscape that they're watching and they love everything about it and even though it takes a special person to usually you know especially take one of those backcountry lookouts those who are in the front front country really seem to enjoy the people too and and love sharing the knowledge you know, with this landscape, this is on the left is actually from Patrol Lookout, which is out by us. And my friend Sam Sarah, who's up there, like I said, I think she's closing in on 25 years now. I mean, she could tell you every mountain and she just knows it. And she knows all the plant life and, you know, what it takes to be able to watch those wisps of smoke and determine what's going on. And that was one thing talking to her really hit home for me because it was after World War II that kind of the heyday of the lookout started to fade. Once we had aircraft, the Forest Service determined that, you know, it's more efficient. We can cover more ground with aircraft and we don't have to put these people in these high places and, you know, take the pack strings up to them and keep an eye on them. So a lot of the lookouts went in disrepair or they were burned or, you know, dismantled somehow. And it really takes away from the importance of having a person there. Not only do these people know this landscape, you know, and I think, you know, Sam Sarah said she can tell, she could see a tree smoldering where even the satellites, as good as they are, they can't. I mean, it's like, it's different when you have somebody who knows it so well to be able to look at the landscape. And I also believe too, that it's an important part of a public interface too. So whether you're on forest service and especially in the national park, these are the people who it's that extra touch to be able to educate the public. And one thing, you know, with the public too, it's like they have the questions, especially when it comes to fire 
because fire gets such a bad rap, you know, and rightly so in some respects, you know, when, when Sperry burned, it was heartbreaking. And I have to say, you know, that was one of the things with the Na Glacier National Park Conservancy that really made me love the Conservancy that much more was their effort to support it and bring back the rebuilding. So something like that is, is hard. But then when you see the effects, the benefits on the landscape years, I mean, even decades later, where you see where fire has gone through and how much better the forest is or the landscape is, then you really start to appreciate it. So this need, you know, I definitely working on this project, I definitely see a need for preservation to hold on to what we still have. This is a little corner of, it's called Hogback Lookout outside of Helena. And in the lower, lower left above the one tree, you could see a wisp of smoke. And that was one of the fires burning in the Little Belts last year. The boys and I ran up here to check out this lookout and thought it was ironic that we could see the start of our summer season last year. But this is an example of one that might be torn down soon. I, I you know, here through the grapevine, I have to confirm it, but you know, they're looking at te possibly tearing it down because it's not being used anymore. And now within Glacier National Park, the cool thing is with our nine current lookouts, we have the Northwest Montana Lookout Association that does a terrific job of handling the preservation efforts. And they have for a really, really long time. So they'll hike up to the places. I mean, they've even worked on Heaven's Peak and they go into Porcupine. And so they go in to check it, do assessments, and they've, they're wrapping up work on Mount Brown this year. And so they're a really good group that goes in there and makes sure that our lookouts are, are standing up because they, they live in the harshest country that we can dish out around here up on the top of these mountains. But so we have to do what we can to keep them going. Now my dream, you know, so coming down from Huckleberry last September, but my dream would be at least in Glacier National Park, if I had a wish list, it would be that all, all the lookouts, or most of them, maybe not, or maybe not Heaven's Peak, but most of the lookouts were staffed because I just think it's that important to have people there because people are definitely using these trails and to have somebody there to offer that bit of education is definitely really, really important. So Huckleberry, when we were up, they had just recently closed, but it's a treat to be able to go up and talk to the lookout and find out what they're seeing because even though the trails are busy, they have those moments where this whole area is just, they have it just to themselves and they get to see this space like nobody else does. And so they're a really good, really good touchstone for all of us. And I just wanted to end that if anybody wants to hike or if you want to talk lookouts that just amygreesack.com and email me and we can go from there. So thank you so much. Now, any questions? Wow. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have lots of questions, but it looks like we maybe have at least one in the chat and um, Geneva, do you want to take that question or ask that question of Amy? Yeah, for sure. Um, Amy, this question is from Eric and Tanya, and they ask, uh, were, were most of the fire lookouts on NPS lands or Forest Service? Um, and is there any difference in philosophies between the agencies on where the lookouts were positioned or the type of construction? It seems, well, there's more, there are more lookouts on Forest Service land. And just because of the amount of ground that they need to cover. The National Park Service ones, at least in Glacier, they all seem to be a similar structure. They were about 14 by 14 feet. And and they they kind of, well, except you know, Swift Current is different, Heaven's Peak is different, but the other ones are very, very similar. You know, 14 by 14, Apgar and some of the others had a short roof line while some came over the catwalk a bit more. But in the ones on the Forest Service land, they were all over the place with design. If they were built during the 1930s, they were pretty much put together so the Civil Con or Civilian Conservation Corps could easily put them together. But they were more designed for the site because some sit directly on the rock, such as Patrol Mountain outside of Augusta here near where I am. 
versus others like straw it's called strawberry lookout outside of helena and it is 60 feet tall to be able to see over the trees so so designs were all over the board although the national park is more con more consistent Great. Um, and then another question from Larry, are there still helicopter companies operating in the glacier area for both firefighting and visitor tours? I believe so. I think the helicopter tours are still going on. And when it comes to firefighting, you know, they pull out all the stops. If you know, well, depend, I shouldn't say that depending on where the fire is located, because current policy, if it's in a wilderness area, Fire is a good thing. It's a regenerative thing. And so if it's in a wilderness area where it's not going to harm structures or people, they'll let it go and keep it at bay and, you know, keep it contained there. But if it's close to structures, you know, we'll see helicopters and everything else going. Um, another one from Lois and Bill. Uh, why actively tear down decommissioned lookouts rather than passively let nature take its course? Um, is that a safety hazard even in remote areas? I, I think that's it. I think that's the primary reason that they either dismantled them or, you know, a lot of times they would burn it just for kind of liability things. Now on the Forest Service land, there are lookouts that are, they're not in the best shape. But they're there. And the cool thing is, is they'll leave them open. And so if you are hiking, you can just you can just go in and you can stay. You're camping with mice. <laughs> Lots of rodents are your bedmates. But yeah, there's some that you could definitely just hike to any time of the year and camp. Very cool. Um, and then Jeremy asks, which lookout is your favorite? Oh, we were talking about that ahead. It's kind of like the one that I'm at currently. It's, and that's how I am with every hiking trail. I'm like, oh, this is my favorite. But, oh, Scalp Lock has to be one of my favorites just because I've been up there quite a few times and, and need to go up again. And it's in an area of the park that isn't as crowded either, which I really love anytime I could be the only person on the trail. I'd love to go up to Scalp Lock. And of course, it's proximity to to Essex and the Isaac Walton. What's funny is I never hiked it when I worked at the Isaac Walton. I was just like, I'm not going up that hill. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, I'm like, I'm not doing inclines. And now I'm like, oh, okay, 4,000 feet, 3,000 feet, why not? It's the that's downhill awesome. that's tougher now, right? It is. And that's what buggered up my knee, but it's healing. Leading off that question, um, how many fire lookouts have you been to? Do you know? Is that something you've kept track of? Well, let's see. I think I'm only at like 15 or 16 now. And so we want to do 40. And la But last year, oh, I was so excited last year to get started. And I was off to a great start to get ones that are easy to reach in May and then in June. And then, of course, everything with the fires. It was like, this is ironic that fires are really thwarting my plan, but it certainly did. But I'm anxious. There's several that are backcountry ones that want to get to. And so it's, yeah, it's in this project now. So instead, originally the deadline was going to be August of this year. And when I talked to my editor last year and I said, it's, it's impossible to be able to hike to everything. And so we even talked about the end of next year and I still told him, I said, I'm not confident that I can do it. So we're just, we're kind of putting it on the back burner, but the nice thing is it's gonna give me that time that I feel this will be an excellent book by the end because I can take the time to get to everything. And plus I'm just so fussy when it comes to photos. There's been several already that I've done that I need to do again because the, the sky wasn't blue enough. I'm just a brat. <laughs> which of the uh, lookouts that you have been to, which um, have been the hardest to get to, in your opinion? Scalp lock. <laughs> it's like, it's funny how that's probably my favorite, but that was the hardest one too. And it was, it was funny though, because I used to ride my horse up there all the time. And I mean, it was one of our favorite rides. And by golly, it's a lot tougher hiking. <laughs> And we were going up, I was going up with friends and great huckleberries to pick on the way, which, you know, you, it's, 
an excuse to catch your breath, but it's like, oh, I got to eat some huckleberries. <laughs> and so you get up though. And when you're going up, you feel like you're going to round the corner and it's going to be there. But no, you go there and there's another, you know, it looks like it's straight up. And my friend Darcy was with me and she's like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> if, if it was a cliff, I think she would push me off. <laughs> um, back on the topic then of the decommissioned lookouts, um, Carl asked, has anyone ever thought about designating them as landmarks to try and save them? See, that's what would be lovely. And I'm not sure, you know, with the present Montana or the Northwest Montana Fire Lookout Association or Lookout Association, if they've done that. I know they they do a tremendous amount of work on the Forest Service land too, to be able to maintain maintain these. And you know, I'm sure with funds and time we could do anything. But that would, you know, if you're talking ultimate dream, it would be rebuilding the ones that are gone. Because well, there's one on Divide, which is out. It's not technically in the park. It's just outside St. Mary. And it's this really cool octagon and it, you know, it's on the Blackfeet reservation and it's every year it's collapsing and it would be so cool to be able to rebuild it because everybody loves to go there, but I know <laughs> so much to do. Amy, are there other associations like the Northwest um, Fire Lookout Association that, that works on preserving them in There's Montana? Also well, no, it's just that one in Montana, but there's the national organization, the what Forest Fire Lookout Association. So yeah, and they're, they're kind of the main one. And then the Northwest Montana chapter is with them. Okay. So, but yeah, the Northwest chapter, they do, they do a lot, but yeah, we need, we need something on the East side here too. Mm. Yeah. Cause there's just, well, most, most of the lookouts in Montana, I mean, granted are the Libby area, you know, Flathead, Bitterroot. That's where the bulk of the lookouts are. We do have some here in central Montana along the Rocky Mountain front, and there's actually a few out in farther eastern Montana as well. No, oh, they ha they do have trees out there. <laughs> <laughs> there are things to burn. Yeah, uh, Carl and Candy have a great question. Um, is there anything really unusual that has been seen at the lookouts? such as UFOs? Ooh, that, I don't know. That would be an interesting question to ask some of the lookouts. Cause yeah, they have, they have that perspective nobody else has. Right, yeah, or I was thinking great. Carl and Candy along those same lines, if any of the lookouts are haunted, if it, that might be a book, a book as well. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to start asking those questions. I like that. <laughs> And this is why my editor highlighted my word count in red for all my chapters. <laughs> He's like, you can only go there. I'm like, oh, so I'm going to win. And Jeremy just added a question. How, do you know how you become a lookout? A lot with the National Forest Service, definitely talk to the district people. And I believe it's USA Jobs, I think it is where you can look for federal jobs and see what's available. So a really good start though, to be able, depending on what experience you already have and whether you're already in the forest service system would be volunteering for one of these lookouts that do staff with volunteers because they do provide training. And then you have that experience to be able to get your foot in the door. But yeah, it would, it would I always say when I grow up, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Maybe when your kids grow up, right? Yes, that's the reality. <laughs> <laughs> so Amy, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned uh, David's book as a real resource for you. Um, how else are you researching? Is there a lot of history out there? You mentioned the archives. Does the Montana Historical Association have information? Um, how do you find out? That, that is the hardest part of everything. And I've talked to so many historians, you know, including a uh, gentleman, Mark, who staffs Baptiste at Hungry Horse Reservoir. And he is a professional historian. And he and I talked last year and he's like, it's not there. A lot of the history and the details, for some reason, the Forest Service, for example, has whole diet or 
details of buildings in the Bob Marshall wilderness, but they barely mention the fire lookouts, nor and and no details. And it's just bizarre. And I, you know, talked to many historians. I'm like, what am I missing? Because you know, a couple of years ago, I did a historical book of Yellowstone, and you know, so I'm I'm good at digging, and I'm good at finding stuff like this, and it's just not there. So it's it's been talking with the Montana Memory Project and and the Lookout Association, because a lot of those members are very, very knowledgeable, trying to find people who are former lookouts, because a lot of times they'll write down history that just is doesn't become official type thing. So yeah, that's been the hardest thing ever is finding kind of the official narrative of every story from every lookout. We are going to... Um per usual at our Glacier Conversations, um, we like to do a little giveaway. Um, so we're gonna do that in just a minute. I have a print, I hope it will show, um, of an artist. We're gonna work on that. Um, <laughs> maybe I can take a picture and upload it. Um, anyhow, it's a really great print of um, Sunrise at Logan Pass. Um, so we'll draw a name for that in just a bit. Um, but Amy, you mentioned, um, well, we've been talking about the actual lookouts themselves. There have been some famous lookouts. Is that correct? You mean, oh, like Edward Abbey and John or Doug Peacock? Yes. You know, that's been, you could see just from their writings how much staying at the lookout impacted them. And it just, it's really interesting. I think, like I said, it takes a special per person to be a lookout. And I think just as much that experience makes that impression on people too. Sure. Uh, for those of you who are fans of the Glacier podcast, Headwaters, and if you haven't listened yet, you should, um, but they definitely do a little piece on um, one of the lookouts in Glacier in season one. Um, so you should all go and listen to um, the story of Edward Abbey being in, in a lookout in Glacier. Um, let's see, a couple of other questions from the chat. Again, Carl and Candy, um, what are the bathroom facilities in the lookout or are we talking the great outdoors? No, they usually have a, a, an outhouse at every lookout. And actually, I always joke that I wanna do a book on them because some of the outhouses have the absolute best view. The one at Scout Block is absolutely fantastic. You gotta have the door open, but you're looking at you know St. Nicholas and just the whole range. And then Lone Man too. I mean, that's a bugger to get up to that one. You have to cross the river and I think it's about seven miles up, but the outhouse situation was absolutely stunning. So, so yeah, outhouses. And speaking of facilities, what else would you expect inside the lookout as far as cooking, um, sleeping? They're usually pretty, pretty basic, you know, a bed, table, chair type thing. A lot of times they'll have a propane stove and refrigeration differs. You know, a lot of times it's, you know, propane. Some of the lookouts come in and out, they'll stay there. And I'm not sure exactly what the park does, but some will come out or will be at the lookout for 10 days, come out for a couple of days, but some stay at the lookouts all summer. I mean, they do not go in at all because they're, it's just too much. And so they'll have supplies packed up to them, which is, you know, and they all have radios so they can let them know what they need, that type of thing. But what's really interesting with the lookouts, what fascinated me was lightning, you know, because you're at the highest point. And so basically, you know, there's a lightning rod and the copper cables coming down typically in all directions to disperse the energy. It's like, oh, it's a Faraday cage, basically, that's around it. But you know, still, I don't know how comfortable I would be. I don't care if there's a lightning rod on top. And so even on the inside too, they'll often have glass insulators on the bottoms of the chairs and the table and the bed and things like that. So if it is struck, hopefully you're not going to get zapped. And I haven't heard of anybody. I'm, I'm sure it's happened, but, or maybe it's happened, but I've never read of anybody getting electrocuted inside a lookout. 
So interesting. Um, Larry wanted to know, are lookouts rotated between different locations or do they stay in the location with which they're most familiar? Typically. I think it depends on the person because I know several lookouts who it's the same lookout year after year. And, you know, I think whether it's the National Park Service or the Forest Service, I think they're probably happy to have, if that person wants to come back, it just adds to that institutional knowledge that that person knows that landscape. And if they're comfortable being there, I think that's the best. So at least with the Forest Service, it seems if they want to go back to that lookout, that lookout's theirs. And speaking of going back, you mentioned that your friend has been 25 years back at the same lookout, correct? Mm -hmm. Or around that? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. and tell, tell everybody here what you told us about the supplies that you've brought her in the past and that you'll be bringing her this year. Well, she might be listening, but, oh. <laughs> but I have yarn for her. Last, last, or the last time I brought her honey, which was too heavy. So now she gets yarn because she's a great knitter and that's what she does. And, you know, she passes the time and she's, you know, she's always busy. So yarn's going to be a lot lighter. And, and is she on the conversation? Would she tell us no. more? I, uh, yeah, if Sam Sarah is on, <laughs> she's getting ready to go up. All right, Sam, well, if you're on, let us know. Maybe you can tell us a few more stories. <laughs> oh, she's fabulous. Um, let's see, Jeremy has another question. What about water? Um, are they rationing water? Uh, are they typically close enough to water sources? How does that work? Typically not. I think, you know, such as patrol that I'm thinking of, it's a good mile or so down to where there's a spring. And of course, this mile, you're gaining well over a thousand feet of elevation, probably 1500 feet of elevation from the lookout down to what's called Honeymoon Basin, where there's the spring. So definitely rationing water in that situation. She might have, and think on some, you know, the mules might be bringing up some water because if not, it would be kind of a constant project. And I know it has is for some of the lookouts where they have to hike a mile or mile and a half to be able to fill up and then get back up to the lookout. So there's not too many. I'm trying to think of any where there's a close water source and I can't think of any. So these yeah. people have no problem getting their steps in. I'm guessing no, no. Well, <laughs> very, very good people. Yeah. So we did draw a name for the print. Let me try one more time to, it's just not gonna, oh, might have to turn. Oh, you guys got a little glimpse of it. There's a little bit of the sun, the sunset. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a, a painting print um, by Alyssa Shaw. She's an artist who's a big fan of Glacier. And so she sent it to us and asked us to give it away um, to one of our, our great donors. Um, so Kathy W, I drew your name um, and we will, we will get it in the mail out to you as a, a little token of our appreciation for joining the conversation tonight. Um, Amy, you mentioned, you know, your book on fire lookouts has not been put on hold. It's just gonna take a little bit longer. Um, what? What after that? What other projects are you, or in the meantime, do you fit other things in um, while you're working on a book? Um, there's probably always something going on, either gardening or photography or writing. So what else do you have your, your eyes set on? Well, I definitely, I frequently write articles for magazines. That's the constant, that's the, the cash inflow type thing. So always working on articles and then also just trying to enjoy as much of the Montana summer as we can for as short as it is. So definitely taking the boys out hiking and kayaking and fishing. And because the beauty of being a self-employed, you know, a freelance writer is everything is possible fodder for an article. So I never know when I'm out, you know, what, what's gonna catch my attention. You know, for example, we hike a lot along the Rocky Mountain front and so I just wrote an article for Rock and Gem magazine on the uh, geology is called seashells at 7,000 feet and talking about, you know, why we're finding these fossils from an ancient ocean bed 
at these high elevations. And so, yeah, so it's just getting out, experiencing, taking photos, and then writing about it. Uh, it looks like Janet has a question. I'm going to unmute you, Janet. Maybe. How do lookouts shower or bathe? I think it's pretty much like we do when we're camping. And I think it depends on the lookout situation. But for the ones who stay up there throughout the summer, it's just kind of a really easy camper's bath type thing. You know, maybe a baby wipes type thing. Uh, there are others that, you know, they'll be at the lookout for seven, 10 days at a time and they don't shower <laughs> and then they come into civilization, get cleaned up and then go back. So yeah, it would be pretty sparse. It's pretty sparse back there because water is definitely a precious resource. Uh, let's see, uh, Lo Lois and Bill uh, commented that there looks like there are a number of movies that take place in lookouts or are about lookouts, not highly rated, but they saw um, Those Who Wish Me Dead in 2021 um, with Angelina Jolie. Um, do, have you come across any history or information about lookouts being used for movies? I Well, outside of the one that I would like to include in the book, kind of an honorable mention, is the one that was used in the movie the Always. That was what Richard Dreyfuss back in the 90s, I think. And that was a fun firefighting movie. And the lookout there that they used, it's up, part of it was filmed up by Libby and Lake Kukanusa and everything. So that's one I want to check out. But I heard the Angelina Jolie film was good. Even, even in my lookout world, they were nodding their approval. So I still have to watch it. But I heard that was a good one. But yeah. Uh, and then there's another, it wasn't in a movie, but there was actually one in Helena that I want to check out called Guardian of the Gulch, because of course, you know, Helena burned was it back in the 30s. And so this was just kind of a way to keep an eye on the valley. So the lookouts have been valuable for, oh, more than a century for us. And Amy shifting gears a little bit, um, since I don't, I don't think I missed any questions, but if I did, or Geneva, if you saw something that I missed, um, yeah, feel free to keep asking about lookouts, but I'm super interested in your gardening as well, Amy, being in Great Falls and in Montana, um, you know, it can be, it can be tough to garden here, but tell us more about that. Well, like I mentioned, I had all the gardens in Corum. And I thought Quorum was difficult when I bought the property in Quorum before I even built the house. I took a shovel and I was going to get the gardens going because I've been gardening since I was 10. And I put the shovel in the ground and I teetered back and forth because it was all rock. And so that's why I decided to pull up the rock and build all those raised beds out of the stone. But then when we moved over to Great Falls about 15 years ago, I discovered that Great Falls is harder to garden than in Quorum. <laughs> so it is is it's tough over here the soil is either clay or sand and it's very alkaline and we have less water than the west side i mean we have an inch more water here than Air tucson arizona and the wind and so for all my decades of gardening i had to relearn things when i came over here and one was you know how to protect everything so you're balancing wind breaks with fencing versus the amount of sunlight that you can get to your plants and oh it's yeah it's challenging i have a little greenhouse that we had to tuck in between the privacy fence and the house just so it won't blow away and even then we've had to tie it to the fence on occasion <laughs> so yeah and my my poor little plants this last couple of weeks all my peppers are looking rather haggard because i built i had to get back into stone this summer I love stone and my, I built, it's called a keyhole garden. So it kind of looks like Pac-Man, like the shape of Pac-Man. And it's about waist high, built out of stone. And in the bottom, I put like big hunks of logs and organic material. So it's kind of a hugel culture concept where you have this large chunky organic mass at the base. And then I put a cylinder with uh, hardware mesh, so screening. 
And that's my compost bin. I filled it up and I planted my plants. So underneath, it's going to decompose slowly. It's going to act as a good water retention sponge, basically. And then I have my little compost bin where I just put my kitchen scraps in and the worms are taking care of it. It's like even if for weeks of putting, you know, huge bowls in, it just keeps going down. So it's self-feeding the whole garden. So I'm loving it and I want to build more. My husband's not going to be happy because he won't let me gather rock <laughs> because he thinks I beat up the truck too much. So, so he's going to have to get it. <laughs> well, you certainly are a woman of many talents. Um, I have I have one final question, um, glacier related. I know that you have written a few articles about the dark skies, um, which is near and dear to our heart, of course. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that. Tell us a little bit more about uh, your involvement with Dark Skies. Well, I know John Ashley, who helped start the Montana chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. And then, of course, being in Glacier so much and all the work that you've done to establish that as a, as a dark sky has just been mind blowing. And it's one of those places that, you know, in Montana, we take it for granted. We take dark skies for granted, even in in some place like Great Falls, which is bigger, to be able, you know, it's still dark enough that we could see the Milky Way. And then when you get to the park, and then when you have people who are from different parts of the country who finally make it to Glacier and they experience that dark sky, it's something that you cannot describe until you see it. And so it's just, and the observatory over at St. Mary, I mean, you're just bringing something to people that there's no way they can touch any other way. So I, I, I absolutely love it. Well, thank you for, um, and I wanna thank everybody who joined us tonight. Um, what a treat it was to learn from Amy. Um, next month we will be doing book club um, and our book next, next month is The Weight of the Night. Um, and we will talk with Christine Carbo on July 13th. So that's something to look forward to. And the August conversation we're still working on, but we will hear from um, about one of our past projects, um, the Bighorn Sheep. So we will have an update there. Um, and the rest of our programs will soon be posted online as soon as we schedule them. Um, and I hope that everybody here has a happy and festive and safe 4th of July. And we will um, see you all yeah, hopefully in July at book club. Thank you for joining. And Amy, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful summer. <laughs>